Solutions versus KAS, docket number 1252-18. Counsel for plaintiff, please enter your appearance. Uh, good morning, Your Honor. Uh, Christopher Morrow from the law firm of Camacho Morrow Mulholland, on behalf of the plaintiffs. All right. Counsel for KAS. Good afternoon, Your Honor. Josh Yeager from the law firm Kramer Spina for KAS2. Good afternoon, Your Honor. Anthony Knapp from Post and Shell, also on behalf of KAS2. Okay. All right. Counsel for uh, Mobile Wash. Mobile is okay. Counsel for Mobile Wash. Good afternoon, Your Honor. David McHale from the law, law firm of Langston, Stephen, Silver, and Hollander for Judge Mobile Wash. I did not. You can't see, see it right now because my yeah my computer is not uh, cooperating with me. So right now I'm oh. only participating by phone. I hope that's okay. Okay. All right, I think I saw you before, Mr. McHale, while everybody was setting up, but all right. Um, Council for Heil. Good afternoon, Your Honor. Rachel Asitza from Lewis Bridge Park. Can I have your name again? Let me see. It's Rachel Asitza. Okay. And Council for Agility Fuel Systems. Uh, Robert Devine from the law firm of White and Williams, representing the agility entity. So good afternoon, Judge. Good afternoon. Uh, let's see how we're doing. Okay. Um, I read this is an interesting circumstance for me, and I'll just say to counsel, um, I'm look. I'm not relying on courtesy copies. I have, and that's part of the reason why I have my um, two different devices going now. I have your file up in eCourts. I tried to make notes to get to the points I need. In addition, I also have uh, Lexis up for the cases. Um, but nonetheless, um, but I did read the papers. And um, since uh, this is KAS's motion, do you want to briefly summarize your position? And would you mind if I interject a question? as you say something, um, and but I'll let you summarize your position. Uh, absolutely, Your Honor. This is Josh Yeager for KAS2. Um, I, I kind of plan to make a, a very short argument, I think, today, uh, knowing that we're doing this through Zoom. So I do want to just hit the main points. I know there is significant briefing before Your Honor, and I don't intend to you know, retry to regurgitate for you the entire briefing. I just want to hit the high points and by all means, if you have any questions, please feel free to ask. Um, as you correctly noted, Your Honor, this is my client's motion to dismiss Agility's third-party complaint against us for lack of personal jurisdiction. My client is not a main defendant. We were not sued by the Plaintiff Republic Services. We are just one of, I think, four or five different third-party defendants brought into this case by Agility. Um, on the issue of personal jurisdiction, of course, Agility has the burden to establish a prima facie case of personal jurisdiction over my client. I think a very brief overview of the roles of the different parties in the chain of distribution here is essential to understanding the issues before you on personal jurisdiction. I tried to summarize those quite well on page 10 of the supplemental reply brief that we filed on April 3rd. I think that's a very good reference point if you want to go back to that, Your Honor. I'm um, looking at it, counsel. Okay. And okay. in fact, I might have um, I might have highlighted that in my notes, okay. but I'll, the, I'm getting it up. Page 10, you said. Sure. And so just remembering that my client uh, manufactures mm. and sells bulk hose. So, you know, sell it by the how many hundred feet of, of hose do you want? And they would sell that hose. And in, in this particular instance here, if this is our bulk hose that ended up on the garbage truck, the chain of distribution is very important. My client would have manufactured and, and sold the bulk hose from its facilities in Connecticut. That would have been sent to All Hose. All Hose would have located in Massachusetts. All Hose would have taken the bulk hose from my client. They would have cut it to certain lengths um, and sold it with end fittings um to motion industries motion industries is located in alabama motion industries would take the bulk hose and the different fittings from the different manufacturers 
cut the hose down to shorter lengths and attach fittings to the hose to basically make a hose assembly. Motion from Alabama would then send that hose assembly to Agility, um, also located in Alabama. Agility would then design and manufacture the entire fuel system that ended up going onto this truck. When Agility was done with its work in Alabama, they would then send the fuel system components to Heil, located in Tennessee. Heil would then assemble um, the, the fuel system in, in the rest of the truck uh, in Tennessee or elsewhere. And then at some point in time, the truck would have made its way back to New Jersey. Um, so I think it's important to know that the bulk hose that my client may have manufactured would have passed through the hands of at least four other companies in at least three other states before this garbage truck ended up in the state of New Jersey. Um, as you know, your personal jurisdiction is a state-specific inquiry. Um, so what we're dealing here with is only my client's contacts with the state of New Jersey. Uh, so any contacts with Philadelphia, with Pennsylvania, whatever ruling uh, the judge in Pennsylvania and Philadelphia may have made on different jurisdictional facts based on Pennsylvania law really has no relevance here. Um, we are dealing with, you know, viewing two different things, general jurisdiction, which as you know, uh, is jurisdiction based on contacts with the forum state of, of New Jersey that would not be related to Agility's causes of action against Kongsberg uh, or specific jurisdiction. And specific jurisdiction, um, the cause of action, Agility's cause of action must arise out of my client's personal jurisdiction contacts with the state of New Jersey, and also uh, must have constitutionally sufficient personal jurisdiction contacts. Um, about jurisdiction, I'll, I'll only just talk about the one factor uh, because the other uh, is kind of goes together with general jurisdiction. Uh, so when you talk about for specific jurisdiction, Agility's cause of action must arise out of my client's contacts with the state of New Jersey we know based on what I just discussed about the chain of distribution and the roles of the parties that that absolutely cannot be at issue in this case. Because we know that the bulk hose that my client may have manufactured would have passed through at least four other companies' hands uh, in at least three different states before the garbage truck made its way to New Jersey. Um, and each one of those companies would have done something different to take that bulk hose cut it, assemble it, uh, manipulate it somehow uh, to, to its ultimate final form. Um, and so there is no contact at all that my client had with the state of New Jersey as it relates to Agility's cause of action, as it relates to this particular garbage truck and the components on this particular garbage truck. And so without that, there cannot be and there is no legal authority that would support a finding of specific jurisdiction over my client. Just changing over to the, the other issue of general jurisdiction, which, as we know, is based on just general contacts with the state of New Jersey, um, not necessarily related to or making uh, Agility's cause of action arise out of the contacts. Over the past six years, as we detailed in our briefs, the U.S. Supreme Court has clarified and set a very high bar for general jurisdiction, in particular, the Daimler and the BNSF cases. Um, you know, the U.S. Supreme Court made it clear in Daimler that only a very, very limited set of affiliations with the forum state will render a defendant uh, subject to personal jurisdiction there. The defendant basically has to be regarded as at home in the forum state here of New Jersey in order to be subject to general jurisdiction. And the, the Supreme Court said that absent exceptional circumstances, a corporation is only going to be at home and found to have general jurisdiction in two places, its place of incorporation and its principal place of business. There's no question that my client was incorporated in Connecticut, has its principal place of business in Connecticut. Based on the guidance from the Supreme Court, that should be enough to say there cannot be general jurisdiction here. Um, and that the only way there could be is if there was exceptional circumstances of some sort of continuous activity in the state. And we know that's not true as well. Um, in the Daimler case, 
the uh, defendant there had multiple facilities, physical facilities in the forum state. It had a regional office in the forum state, and it was the most successful market participant in its field within the forum state. And the Supreme Court said, no, that's not enough for general jurisdiction uh, because they were not incorporated there and did not have their principal place there. Uh, just about three years ago, the Supreme Court clarified even further in the BNSF case about what is necessary for general jurisdiction. And in that case, the defendant railroad, um, the, the forum state was Montana. They were not incorporated there and did not have a principal place of business there. But what they did have is a railroad. They had over 2000 miles of railroad track there. They had over 2000 workers in Montana and they actually had a physical automotive facility there. And the court said uh, for purposes of general jurisdiction, that is not enough because BNSF would not be found to be at home there. Now, when you compare that to my client in this case, uh, my client has significantly less contacts with New Jersey than did the defendants in Daimler and BNSF. In particular, in BNSF, they had over 2,000 miles of railroad track in the forum state, railroad track essentially being a permanent fixture. And, and in this instance, my client shipped pursuant to Agility's own math, shipped, you know, about 1.6 miles worth of hose into New Jersey over a seven year time period. That averages out to basically just a little less than a quarter of a mile per year. Compare that with over 2000 miles of railroad track to BNSF. And BNSF, they had over 2000 workers in the forum state. And in this case, it's uncontroverted. My client had no workers no employees in the form state of New Jersey. At, at best, they had some employees from Connecticut that occasionally traveled to New Jersey, nothing like the over 2000 workers in BNSF. And also in BNSF, they had the defendant in that case actually had a physical automotive facility in the form state. Here it's uncontroverted. My client has no physical facilities, offices, what have you in the form state of New Jersey. And so if the, the contacts of Daimler and BNSF in those respective cases was not enough for a finding of general jurisdiction, then there's absolutely no legal authority upon which my client could be subject to general jurisdiction here in this case. And so for the reasons stated in the brief, the multiple briefs, I should say, uh, again, which I don't want to regurgitate here, and then based on this sh short argument, Your Honor, I think it's very clear that this is a case where it would not be constitutional to assert personal jurisdiction over my client, whether it be specific jurisdiction or general jurisdiction. Thank you. Thank you. Honor. All right, Agility, um, Agility Fuels. Yeah, uh, good afternoon, Your Honor. Uh, first, I would just point out the fact that the plaintiff public services did not sue KAS is not material to the analysis. Uh, personal jurisdiction analysis in this case, whether it's Pennsylvania or New Jersey, is to the fullest extent permitted by the United States Constitution. The council tried to draw a distinction between the Pennsylvania law or New Jersey law with respect to the exercise of personal jurisdiction. Each state is identical as to the fullest extent permitted by the United States Constitution, which going into the cases I've cited, International Shoe and Burger King, is to, uh, if they purposely avail themselves in the state, as long as it does not offend traditional notions of fair play, uh, they are amenable to jurisdiction in that state. I would point out specifically that our, our position is that specific jurisdiction uh, is the correct analysis in this case. Putting that aside, however, the record is sufficient under the case law I cited in my briefs to meet the burden of general jurisdiction. Uh, by way of background, Your Honor, this hose assembly is known as a Model T-1700 hose. The discovery that we took on a jurisdictional basis after this accident with respect to product called out in spreadsheets, as well as deposition testimony of a Consworth designee, Mr. Paulson, uh, established that T-1700 hoses were in fact shipped into New Jersey uh, and the dollar amount of those sales approaches $2 million. 
with respect to uh, the purposeful availment in the state. I've also gone through in my papers and pointed out in this case that the accident occurred in New Jersey. Consberg knows its T1700 hose is going to be put in vehicles which will have a nationwide presence, but in particular regard, will be present in New Jersey. Uh, it is a small issue in this case, Judge, that the initial affidavit of Mr. Paulson indicated that there was no salesman in New Jersey. That was a very crafty and lawyer-like statement in an affidavit that when we took the deposition of Mr. Paulson and placed him under oath and looked him in the eye, he admitted that we send three salespeople into New Jersey regularly with respect to one of their principal contacts in New Jersey, FlexLine. So in this case, we have the exact hose that was involved in this accident being sold by Consberg to one of its customers, FlexLine, in New Jersey. We also have Consberg then sending sales individuals into this state as well. And I've actually cited an appellate division case, which Agility gets the benefit of, because I believe there's been discovery shortcomings and quite frankly, uh, slippery answers, I'll leave it at that, with respect to what KAS submitted in the discovery process. The case I've cited in my brief, uh, Mastro Rea, allows there to be inferences that are drawn. And when you look at Mr. Uh, Paulson's uh, deposition testimony, uh, he admitted that he did not actually look beyond the spreadsheet and look for other information or other documents or other materials that would have been sent into New Jersey. So I sent a corporate designee note under our rules of civil procedure, a corporation such as KAS is bound by the testimony of the designee they produce. They produce Mr. Uh, Paulson, and I've cited in my papers, Your Honor, it's in page uh, 80 through 84, where he goes through and he talks specifically about not having done a duly diligent search so as to fully understand the depth of the penetration of Consberg into New Jersey. Uh, referencing and comparing railroad train track miles to hose miles uh, is, quite frankly, not the proper analysis in this case. When you consider in this case the hoses at issue in this case are cut to various lengths, this case was approximately three feet. When you have over almost two miles sold in and 1,200 feet per mile, that's 5,000 miles. I'm sorry, 5,000 feet of hose, I'm sorry, 5,000 feet of hose. There's 2,500 feet per mile, almost two miles of hose sold in. Dividing that three puts you well over uh, the hundreds uh, in terms of hoses that are sold into New Jersey over this time frame. Uh, with respect to the uh, question of who has the burden, the Burger King case, a U.S. Supreme Court uh, decision, indicated that uh, when there's a, a minimum contacts issue, that continuing obligations or uh, between Kohlberg and residents of the forum is the appropriate analysis. When you're looking at minimum contacts, so as to not offend traditional notions of fair play, uh, you look at the contact with residents of the forum. There's no doubt that, that the discovery in this case revealed substantial and continuous contacts. Uh, Mr. Yeager himself, when he went through and talked about the case law, he actually did concede that continuous activity is one of the exceptions under the general, uh, specific, general uh, jurisdiction analysis. And with respect to continuous activity, our discovery has revealed, which quite frankly was, was hidden by the affidavit, that they do send three sales folks into the state regularly that they do sell regularly T1700 hoses. Over 95% of the sale of hoses into the state are in fact the T1700 hoses. Uh, the case law also looks to the burden on KAS to participate in litigation in New Jersey. Given that they have purposely availed themselves of transacting business in the state using the infrastructure and the roads, 
when you compare and contrast any burden that would be placed on them, particularly when you consider that they participated for over two and a half years in a lawsuit 15 miles away from Mount Holly, Judge, uh, arising out of the exact same accident, exact same occurrence, exact same discovery, went through the discovery process, produced witnesses and documents in a case that's only courthouse to courthouse, less than 15 miles away. Uh, I dare say there's absolutely no burden that's placed on Cogsburg in this matter by being uh, hailed into court and being made to defend this case. The public policy behind the New Jersey Contribution and Joint Tour Feasers Act is very strong. The public policy behind the Contribution uh, and Joint Tour Feasers Act requires the court to uh, bring all tort feasers before the court in one setting. That's for issues of judicial economy. And again, quite frankly, given the Pennsylvania court ruling and the participation in the Pennsylvania litigation uh, that preceded this in large amount out of the same occurrence, uh, there really can be uh, no burden that would be fairly cognizable placed on them as well. Uh, I've actually taken discovery as well that shows Consberg interacted with 27 vendors in New Jersey buying product from them over the relevant time period with respect to the number of years that uh, Your Honor indicated that discovery may be permitted. And what Consberg has done is they have actually said, well, we're such a big company. We're not only national, we're multinational. What we sell or do in New Jersey is only 1% or a very, very small increment of our overall business. Uh, that's not the analysis. Uh, there is no analysis at all that it imposes such a proportionality. It's with respect to the character, kind, and quality of that contact. And there's no doubt that Consberg seeks to avail itself of business opportunities in New Jersey. Consberg buys product from vendors in New Jersey. Consberg sells product. The exact same T17 hose at, involved in this accident into New Jersey. And in fact, uh, Consberg uh, has a website which specifically invites orders on a national basis. And our, our case law has instructed that there is an alternative means of considering jurisdiction, which is called the stream of commerce. And that's really just a recognition of the modern day realities of how we conduct business, not only nationally, but internationally. And when a company purposely avails itself of the benefits of the form state, when they inject themselves into the business arena in that state, such as by having a, a website that invites New Jersey residents and I also put in my papers that when we took the deposition of Mr. Paulson and made inquiry specific with respect to New Jersey connection to the website, he said he didn't know. And I said that in my papers as well. So again, him being a corporate designee on that precise topic, uh, agility is entitled to all the inferences in favor of agility. And again, I've cited to that case that actually allows for that inference to be drawn specifically to a jurisdictional inquiry when there's a jurisdictional discovery failure uh, like there's been in this particular case. Um, one of the cases that was cited by the adversary was the Jay McIntyre case in the papers that had to do with the stream of commerce. Uh, alternative means of establishing personal jurisdiction, but- uh, I'm sorry, counsel, what did you say? You are breaking up there. What case? Um, uh, it's the J period McIntyre case. Okay. And it's cited in Consberg's papers and it uh, an attempt to actually distinguish the stream of commerce uh, alternative means of establishing jurisdiction uh, they fail to indicate that that particular case specifically indicates that the factor to consider is, did you provide regular advice to New Jersey customers? Do you interact with New Jersey customers? Uh, do you sell product for ultimate use in New Jersey? And the answer to all three of those, in the very case they cited, is yes. And that's by reference to the FlexLine client, 
that again they had to admit when there was the deposition taken of their particular designee in this case. Um, they, they also cite the Patel case, that was the Indian case, uh, for the proposition that one discrete sale in the state is not enough to establish jurisdiction. Uh, that, that case is completely distinguishable from our fact, Your Honor, because in, in our case, uh, there is advertising that existed in New Jersey that wasn't present in the Patel case. And in our case, we've established multiple systemic and regular sale of product into New Jersey, which in the Patel case was just the sale of one printing uh, material into the state of New Jersey by an Indian uh, company. Uh, so Your Honor, for all of those reasons that having Consberg participate in discovery in this case, finding that personal jurisdiction is proper, and then giving effect to the contribution among joint tort fees or act strong public policy of bringing all tort feasors uh, should be given effect, and this motion should be denied. Uh, and I've also have given the benefit to your honor of the order entered by a Philadelphia County Court of Common Pleas judge who actually had less compelling evidence than we have in this case, and in the specific form of order found exactly that there was a finding of general and specific jurisdiction as against Kongsberg. I agree that that precedent is not binding on your honor, but it is certainly instructive. And what's most instructive is that in this case, the accident occurred in New Jersey, the New Jersey tax and the availment of the business opportunities in New Jersey were much greater in this case than what the Pennsylvania judge had when they found that there was exercise of jurisdiction over them in this particular case. And I would also point out, Your Honor, that there, in terms of burden on the defendant in this case, the discovery that was done in the Pennsylvania case is essentially going to be used in this case again. So there will be truncated discovery in this case. So in terms of a discovery burden going forward, uh, it, it really is non-existent because there was full and complete participation by Consberg in the Pennsylvania Philadelphia case, which again is only 15 miles from the courthouse uh, in Burlington. I would incorporate all of the arguments that I made in the briefing that was extensive in the case. I have supplied the deposition transcript of Mr. Paulson that was taken both in this case uh, last month, as well as taken in the Pennsylvania case uh, before. Uh, I, I do want to also just highlight in closing what I believe are discovery lapses and incomplete answers, which uh, allow for inferences to be drawn in favor of agility so that the po public policy behind the contribution among the Joint Workers Act can be given effect. There's, there is no uh, offense to traditional notions of fair play and justice uh, by bringing Consberg, known as KAS, before this court. Thank you, Judge. Thank you. Um, okay, Mr. Um, Mr. Yeager, did you want to respond to anything? Very, very briefly, if I may, Your Honor, and I will try to be very short given the Zoom meeting here. Um, plain and simple, Agility's Council is inviting reversible error by even suggesting that the Pennsylvania case is instructive or gu and guiding in any way, period. Uh, it's different facts, different state law, and the fact that a Pennsylvania Philadelphia court judge incorrectly applied Pennsylvania law to a completely different set of f jurisdictional facts um, is no basis that this court could use to assert jurisdiction in this particular case. Um, Let I me say at the outset, I'm not relying on the Pennsylvania decision. Um, okay, great. Um, I'm not relying on that. Um, I feel that um, it's necessary for me to evaluate it based on the facts I have in this matter. Understood, Your Honor. I'll move on. Just a couple of very quick points. I think Mr. Uh, Devine uh, was mixing up general jurisdiction and specific jurisdiction in some of his arguments. Uh, the Patel case, for example, is a case we cited in on the specific jurisdiction analysis. Mr. Devine was talking about that as if it was a general jurisdiction matter. It is not. Um, so it stood for the proposition that specific jurisdiction didn't exist when you had that limited contact uh, directly with the state. What we're dealing with here 
is a subject product, as I talked about, that passed through several different companies and parties' hands in several different states before it ended up coming through New Jersey through other means. So very, very different circumstances, uh, very different circumstances. The issue of discovery, um, as your honor knows very well, uh, we, we complied with original discovery responses. We had some disputes with agility. We came before your honor on those disputes. You ruled in favor of my client on the majority of them. Uh, you allowed some supplemental discovery, which we then responded to. Uh, and produced our corporate representative for deposition. And at no time after that point did Agility ever say that the discovery responses or the deposition uh, was inadequate and that additional discovery needed to be taken on jurisdiction before this issue could be uh, ruled on by your honor. So for them to come in now and suggest that somehow the discovery was not complete, uh, one, uh, that's not true. In fact, there was extensive discovery. And if they had a problem with any of the other issues after we had already argued everything before your honor, they could have raised it before. Um, Mr. Paulson's testimony was quite clear and so was his affidavit. Um, he, he said he, they did not have any employees or salespeople that resided in New Jersey and that's true. And, they, and he also said that he had some people travel from Connecticut occasionally to New Jersey that's true. Those two are those are two different things. Somebody traveling from Connecticut occasionally to New Jersey is very different than having somebody who resides in New Jersey. But the long story short, as for the reasons I already talked about, uh, based on BNSF and Daimler, it, it ultimately doesn't amount to much because it's not enough for general personal jurisdiction. And I think for Mr. Devine to also say that somehow the law suggests that the percentages uh, are irrelevant completely is opposite to the Otacon case out of the District of New Jersey, which we cited in our brief. And in that particular case, the court held that the defendant there had less than 1% one, 1 of their worldwide sales revenues uh, in products to New Jersey, and that that was not enough for personal jurisdiction. And as we said in our papers, we had an average of 0.32% of our worldwide sales shipped to New Jersey, 0.08% invoiced to people in New Jersey, and just a little over 1%, 1 percent, 1.06% of uh, products we purchased from people worldwide came from people in New Jersey. And with the Opticon case, that is directly on point and it's very clear that that's not enough, that's not sufficient. Um, and so I won't go on anymore. I think the, the brief covers everything uh, in, in quite a lot of detail. And when you boil it down and you actually look at what the factors are for specific jurisdiction here, and you know the product didn't end up in some form in New Jersey until it passed through several people in several states, and you know that under BNSF and Daimler that Kongsburg is not at home and there is no exceptional circumstances for purposes of New Jersey, we think that the motion to dismiss should be granted. What's the name of that last case you're talking about? I'm looking for it in your brief. Uh, the case, Your Honor, I'm talking about the percentages. Yes. I will give you the citation here. Because I didn't. It is, um... it is the Otacon case. Uh, cited in the brief, it's 865 F sub second 501 from 2011. Oh, uh, F sub, uh, the federal case. Yes, exactly. Okay. Yes. Yes. Um, All right. Correct, Your Honor. So I appreciate right. your time and patience with the Zoom argument and uh, Zoom argument. And, uh, okay. Your Honor, if I may. Your Honor, if I may. Yes. Uh, thank no. you, Judge. Uh, first on this issue of the, what the Philadelphia County Judge did, uh, as I pointed out, it's not binding on the court. However, it is instructive, and the facts with respect to a New Jersey connection are vastly greater than they were in the Pennsylvania case. Uh, with respect to the discovery issue, uh, there is a corporate designee notice that was sent Consberg had every opportunity to identify the witness or witnesses that they wished 
to present. New Jersey case law is clear that they need to educate the witness. And if a corporation says, I don't know through their designee or says, I can't answer that question, that corporation is stuck with that answer. And that is the uh, case that I've called out in the Master Andrea case talks about discovery violations or inadequacies allow an inference to the defendant that's trying to, or the plaintiff that's trying to assert personal jurisdiction. And that's exactly what happened here. Counsel's argument that is for agility to come back to the court when their own corporate designee says, I don't know, is quite frankly, not in keeping with the rules of discovery in New Jersey and our rules of civil procedure with respect to corporate designee deposition notices. Uh, Mr. Paulson's testimony binds KAS. Mr. Paulson's testimony was he did not know, he did not do the search. And that's on pages uh, 82, 83, 84, where he admitted specifically, I've done no inquiry as to other employee visits into New Jersey. That's an admission by the corporate defendant. So for counsel to say that this is an inconsequential time to time visit by salespeople, cannot be accepted on this record based on the vehicle that was utilized, a corporate designee notice, the corporation's designation of Mr. Paulson. That's the record evidence in this case, and that's what they're stuck with, and I'm permitted to draw the inferences from that. With respect to the uh, federal court case, uh, well, Your Honor, it's just that. It's, it's a federal trial court decision. I suppose it's worth as much as the Philadelphia County Court case that we're talking about right now, but I'll, I'll close my argument with this with respect to percentages. We have $1.9 million of products sold by Kongsberg KAS into New Jersey. And it may only be a few percentage points of this behemoth corporation's sales. However, the size of the corporation, the multinational corporation doesn't get the benefit in a jurisdictional analysis based on its gargantuan sales volume. Imagine a smaller company, Your Honor, that did $500,000 a year in gross sales. Half of it was in New Jersey. That would only be $250,000 of business in New Jersey, but on a percentage basis, it would be half. If counsel's argument was correct with respect to pure proportionality, you would wind up with a rather upside down result that the company that has $250,000 of business, 50%, is subject to jurisdiction in New Jersey, but yet the behemoth multinational corporation uh, is not. And Your Honor, it's crystal clear that Consberg knew its hoses were being sold into New Jersey. They knew the uses that were being made for the hoses. This does not offend traditional notions of fair play. It exerts no undue burden on them whatsoever. And with respect to general or specific jurisdiction under either test. And I do persist in my view that it is a specific jurisdiction analysis because it's a T1700 hose at issue. And one of the claims in this case is going to be the recall effort. Not only was the hose allegedly defective, but then after the hose was put on the garbage truck, was the hose properly recalled? And the expert testimony proof, which we haven't even gotten to in this case, but in the Pennsylvania case, informs the analysis. And all of the defendants were subject to an argument that they should have recalled. So to the extent that Consberg is selling T1700 hose into New Jersey, and we know 95% of their sale of T1700 hoses was to this outfit flex line, that under these circumstances, circumstances, it is absolutely a specific jurisdiction analysis because they are actually interacting with New Jersey residents with respect to hoses. So to the extent there's arguments on recalls and things of that nature, which will invariably be in this case along with others, it is very much a specific jurisdiction. But regardless, uh, I think agility has demonstrated that it's a that the test for general or specific is, is met in this case. Thank you, Your Honor. Okay, thank you. Uh, this is a situ, did somebody wanna speak? Okay. Um, th 
This is a situation where the facts really are not in dispute. It's how the law applies to them. Um, I have no doubt that agility agrees with the chain of distribution that occurred in this case. Um, and I will so find, I will so find that. Um, going further, um, I think there is no question that from their original motion, they give the um, percentages of their um, percentages of their uh, overall um, sales that went to uh, that were shipped to New Jersey, and um, it's summarized in their um, it's summarized in their first brief, and I think reiterated in their second brief. So they're saying that basically it's less than one percent of their worldwide sales that um, that really. Uh, came to New Jersey. So they're relying on that. And I don't think there's any dispute as to the fact as to the interpretation of that. Uh, there is a dispute. Um, there is no dispute that um, uh, KAS did sell um, hoses to New Jersey. Um, I think subsequently it came out that um, I think uh, um, Agility was saying 1.9 million was at 1.9 million in sales, 95% of which was the very hose that we're talking about. I noticed too, um, so that's, that's what we're talking about. And I'm making these statements because, and then, you know, if the appellate division analyzes it, um, I think it's important to establish what facts I'm relying on. And I am relying on the facts given by both parties in this case. Um, and I'll tell you what my legal analysis is. But going forward, um, I have, um, I had a few more questions. Now, it appears that uh, KAS has a website and I, uh, that website, uh, you know, in this day and age, uh, many businesses have websites, but this website certainly gives a court insight as to they have, they sell a vast number of products, um, um, uh, you know, commercially, not just hoses, but they do have quite a large, um, they really um, manufacture many things. Um, however, their website also allows for the inquiry for purchase by anybody. Um, they, uh, it's directed somehow. There is a distributor uh, for them in New Jersey on their website. In addition, um, they have sold, um, they have sold uh, this particular hose to, uh, um, in New Jersey, to people in New Jersey. Even though it was not this particular hose, Apparently, the chain of distribution indicates that it came a by a circuitous route. But nonetheless, this hose is sold in New Jersey. Um, now, does because New Jersey, by its size, have limited um, has limited would have limited purchases. Um, should that deprive New Jersey of jurisdiction? And I don't think so. Um, so I'm not, I'm not so impressed with the minimal amount or the uh, small percentages of KAS's overall um, 
overall sales for all the different products that they have. So they, uh, the website exists, it invites inquiries, it, um, it also uh, uh, shows a location um, in New Jersey. Um, people have come down to um, sell in New Jersey, even though they don't live in New Jersey. Um, and quite, quite substantially in this case, and this case um, is different than many of the cases cited, and I will go through that. Uh, this case is different because the actual, the actual event occurred in New Jersey. The actual fire occurred in New Jersey. Um, and I guess somebody was personally injured and that's, continue, that's in Philadelphia or Pennsylvania. So we're not, um, but we, the property victim here is in New Jersey. So that creates uh, some, um, some distinctions with some of the cases. So, um, the, um, and I'll go through them a little bit. I think I considered most of the facts that I think the, um, there is really no disagreement about the percentages. There's no disagreement. The actual sales of the, um, tubing um, or the hose uh, to New Jersey, the fact that it's a certain percentage of their overall sales um, worldwide um, is, is all a given and nobody really disputes that. Um, and the interesting thing is in this case, and the distribution of this particular hose is not really disputed. But the KAS relies on a couple of cases. I think one being, and I'll take it. Um, they uh, they cite to BNSF Railway versus Tyrail, Rail, and bear with me as I get my notes on that. Um, in that case, this was an interesting case. And that's the problem with some of these jurisdictional cases. Um, BNSF Railroad versus Tyrell, um, the Supreme uh, 137, Supreme Court 154, or 1549, dealt with a federal employee's liability um, act. Basically, um, in that case, um, let's see, it was, what state was that? Montana? Montana was asserting jurisdiction. However, in that case, the plaintiffs were not injured in that state, in Montana, nor did they live in Montana, um, nor did they ever work for the defendant in Montana, in that case, with the railroad. So they were totally unrelated to Montana. And then um, for some reason they determined to file this in Montana. Um, so it's in that perspective that um, the Supreme Court made its decision. Um, they said no in personam jurisdiction uh, in this case because of those circumstances. And then they went to general jurisdiction and that's where they relied on um, uh, BNSF Railroad as not really having their corporate home, as they talked about, in Montana. So that, um, so that case, I think, is distinguishable from this case. Um, uh, KAS also relies on, um, let me look, um, waste management, and waste management uh, versus, um, 
an insurance company. My, I don't like my, I'm, I'm having a hard time reading my own writing council. But um, so it's 138 NJ 106 from 1994. That was a big environmental case. Um, and um, at Waste Management was trying to add a declar uh, started a declaratory action um, against several insurance companies for coverage um, declarations. And um, that was, it was interesting because um, the declaration action was for coverage for claims, 97 in total, but 17 in New Jersey. But the interesting case was the plaintiffs were non-residents. Um, again, that case goes back to 1994 um, and a slightly different era. The, um, then KAS also, well, let's talk about uh, Daimler, Daimler versus uh, Bauman. 571 U.S. 117 um, from 2014. Justice Ginsburg wrote the decision. This is a case um, on general jurisdiction, but um, in this case, foreign plaintiffs um, were trying to sue foreign defendants for events that occurred outside of the U.S. It was in Argentina. The plaintiffs, um, plaintiffs were from Argentina. They alleged that Mercedes-Benz uh, collaborated with, um, collaborated, co uh, collaborated with the state to um, commit terrorist acts or to um, uh, detain, torture, and kill people. Um, and basically they were asserting human rights violations and they uh, filed in California. So um, the plaintiffs asserted general jurisdiction, not personal because they couldn't. And the, um, the defendant did have California based uh, facilities. Uh, it was the largest supplier of luxury vehicles at the time of that um, litigation. And um, there was, uh, the court, however, looked at the contract between Demler and uh, Mercedes-Benz USA. Um, the court also relied um, that in this, in that particular case, um, there could be international consequences and problems if California asserted jurisdiction over occurrences in um, over occurrences in Argentina. Um, there were multiple issues challenging jurisdiction in that case. Um, but the most significant is none of the activities occurred in that state. So um, that's distinguishable. The, um, I also read with interest, um, and let me say this. I read with interest Patel versus um, Carminati AMLLC, 437 NJ Super 415, Appellate Division 2014. I find it interesting, and I'll, this is an aside. Judge Lighthots wrote that decision. In a previous case, um, in, a, in another case, I found, I found personal jurisdiction and um, the appellate division did not like my, um, did not like the fact that I didn't say enough. Uh, they wanted me to make findings of fact. So, and they asked me to, re, to uh, consider Judge Lighthouse's decision in another case and apply those that law to the facts. And I did, I'll tell you, I, so, um, basically, that's why I find it interesting, because it appears that um, there is some respect for her conclusions. But in any event, that case, they, there was, uh, that was done in 2014. 
and um, the there were there were issues there. The uh, defendant had sold property or sold whatever machinery based on the specifications of a New Jersey company to another company. And the sale occurred in um, India, and then that company sold it to the plaintiff. Um, the plaintiff's company and, and the plaintiff was injured. Now, what's interesting is Judge Lighthot says, however, there was no information of defendant's marketing or promotional efforts, such as a website. Um, there is no evidence that the defendant's employees offer training or expertise. Um, and the plaintiff in that case never sought additional discovery. So they relied on a very um, skeletal set of facts, that being the ones that I just said, that the transaction actually occurred in India and um, then it was sold here in New Jersey. And, and under those circumstances, they determined that um, there was no um, personal jurisdiction or no personal jurisdiction as to the uh, machine that caused the injury to the plaintiff. Um, but the statements made by Judge Lighthot seems to indicate that there would be, there's information that's not there. And that case, we do have information in this case. We have that um, the defendant has a website, as I had indicated before, that people can make inquiries through the website, um, that they um, that they also have some a, a, a dealer or a distributor in New Jersey. Um, I think it was Brooklawn. I may be wrong about that. But there was a specific place that people could go to in New Jersey. So Patel kind of gives us guidance otherwise. Um, there is um, the... Okay, so Goodyear, I think the KAS relies on Goodyear, dumb up tires, for the purpose of saying, look, um, a minimal amount of, or a, a small amount of um, worldwide sales should uh, be considered in denying general jurisdiction. I think I'm saying that correctly. Um, so Goodyear was another challenging case. That's a Goodyear Dunlop versus Brown, 564 US 915, and that was recently in 2011. In this case, again, the Supreme Court is faced with, it, it's a little more than Demler because the plaintiffs uh, were North Carolina residents. However, their sons were killed in a bus accident um, outside of Paris. So the actual accident occurred in um, Paris, um, in France. And in that particular case, um, the, the tires were um, sold. It, it, it was a totally different tire that was used over in um, France or in Europe generally. And as opposed to the tire being um, sold in America. However, this cuts both ways. Um, the defendants did sell their tires in North Carolina for uh, specialty vehicles. So the same tires were being sold in North Carolina. Um, and it's, um, but, and oh, this is why KAS, mere purchases in the state did not create jurisdiction. Uh, and I think, I think um, agility did bring up the fact that uh, KAS does make purchases 
from uh, New Jersey vendors. However, they didn't seem to emphasize it here. Um, but these cases you have to take in, in total, uh, consider the entire circumstances. In those cases, the events occurred in another country. Um, the fact that it was a new, you know, a North Carolina resident that was hurt in another country. Um, the Supreme Court said that that would not um, confer jurisdiction on North Carolina. Um, then um, we have. Um, Other cases, I think Labelle Lebe versus Everglades Marina, Inc., 115 NJ317, that telephone calls, mailings, uh, execution of sales contract in New Jersey was sufficient to grant jurisdiction. Um, the, the issues here, Listen, if we had a case, especially from the U.S. Supreme Court, on all fours, I don't think we'd be here and arguing so much, but of course we don't. We have, um, and it's, um, it's interesting, to, the, um, putting the um, product in the stream of commerce, knowing that it might end up in New Jersey, like that McIntyre case, um, is uh, the, the Supreme Court seems to say that that in and, in and of itself was insufficient, but currently we have circumstances in this modern day and age where we have websites and so many, um, so many businesses have those types of websites. When we think of the circumstances here, um, I think it's um, it's we we could have we have a lot of businesses with websites. They could be small businesses, and then they mail their product to another state. Um, does that create jurisdiction? That's on one extreme. Um, and then, of course, we have KAS, who is a worldwide uh, company. Only a small part of it um, is sold in New Jersey, uh, less than 1%. Um, but in this case, we have the actual um, incident and the loss occurred here in Burlington County. Um, we have... The very hose, even though that the hose in this truck wasn't, that, that's a little bit of a distinction from another situation I have. The hose in this truck was not sold in New Jersey, I think. And, and that, that could be this distinction. However, KAS sells those hoses in New Jersey. This one happened to take a different route. Does that mean that um, there's no jurisdiction in New Jersey. Um, the, um, but I, I'll give you my answer. I do find that there's jurisdiction uh, over KAS for a lot of the reasons I already said. Um, it's an international company, so the minuscule part of their sales um, doesn't totally answer the question of jurisdiction. Um, they do sell the specific hose in New Jersey, even though it was not this particular hose. I accept their representations about the distribution in this particular case. Um, the loss occurred here in New Jersey. Um, so, you know, it's, um, 
but I'm not, I think that's what distinguishes it from the uh, Supreme Court cases that are so heavily relied on. Um, the, uh, I rely on the website, the salespeople coming into New Jersey as needed. Um, the website includes a New Jersey location for, I think, distribution. Um, so all of those, um, I find, will provide um, specific jurisdiction in this case. Um, that's kind of a hybrid analysis, but um, I'm relying on the um, the fact that the U.S. Supreme Court seems to have been dealing with totally different circumstances. Um, that being said, is there anything further, um, counsel, on that? Um, do you want to uh, do you want the court to address anything else regarding uh, this decision, counsel? Your Honor, this is Josh Yeager for KAS2. Right. I just had two points. I think you just answered my first one. You know, I, I understand you're denying the motion to dismiss. And I was going to question if you're finding general jurisdiction or specific jurisdiction, but you just stated that you are finding specific personal jurisdiction, correct? Yes. Okay. And then my, my only second point would be, I would ask your honor if you would, um, since you're denying the motion to dismiss, um, and there are certainly the legal issues that we've discussed today, I would just respectfully request if you would uh, find that the appellate division may grant leave for interlocutory appeal in the interest of justice in this case, given the, you know, the different legal issues that we had to address today. Yeah, I would like to be heard on that judge if I could. Yeah. Yes, I appreciate you. And I appreciate your honor indicated that this would be a, a hybrid type of finding, which would of course incorporate both issues of general and specific jurisdiction. But this case is a unique, Your Honor, in that the discovery, there, there is some discovery to be done specific to the unique damage components of Republic, because this is a property case as opposed to the personal injury case in Philadelphia. But the liability aspects of the case, uh, which were quite frankly, uh, all encompassing for a couple of years are pretty much done in this case. So having this go up to the appellate division is just going to introduce inefficiencies because quite frankly, I think this case is, lends itself to a rather shortened discovery period and then a disposition. Uh, so there really is no time saving uh, with respect, nor is there any additional burden put on KAS in regards to participating through the conclusion. And then if they wish to have a power review at that point, but I just wanted to make that point because this would just delay the case even further because at least my more recent experience with the appellate division is you can be there a year. I, I know on an interlocutory, actually, I just got a decision today on something I did uh, more than a year ago, but it wasn't interlocutory. It was um, a final decision. Um, quite frankly, I, um, so I don't know, what are you asking for a stay pending appeal or? Well, I mean, obviously it would be up to the, the appellate court to determine whether they would you know, grant that uh, interlocutory repeal request as well. And to be honest with you, Your Honor, I'm not sure if my client is going to want to do that or not, but I think by Your Honor basically stating in the record that there are, you know, significant legal issues today, which I think is quite evident from the scope of the discussion we just had, I would, I'm just asking that you would find uh, that the appellate division may grant leave for interlocutory appeal in the interest of justice because of those legal issues. And obviously you can't force the court of appeals uh, to do anything, but that would just be you finding that with respect to the legal issues uh, as the, the trial judge who reviewed all the briefs, heard argument and, and just entered your, your ruling. And your honor, my position on that is the standard for certification, which I agree with Mr. Yeager is ultimately for the appellate division to look at 
but it requires a, a substantial difference of opinion over either a controlling question of law or an issue of fact. And this is the most important point. It must materially speed up or lend itself to a quicker termination of the matter. And certification of this invites piecemeal appellate review. And because of the benefit or disadvantage, depending on where you sit, of this matter already being discovered completely, uh, the certification at this point would not materially advance the disposition of this matter. It would have the exact opposite effect. Let me ask you this, Council. What are you asking for me to certify this to the appellate division? I'm not, believe me, I'm not one to usually tell the appellate division what to do. <laughs> no, and, 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 and they like to tell me your, what to in, do, Council. <laughs> Uh, in, your, um, in your honor, that's, uh, I, I certainly appreciate that, and that's why I tried to make it clear that I understand that the ultimate decision would rest with the Court of Appeals. Right. Um, and I'm not asking you to suggest uh, to the Court of Appeals that they need to rule one way or the other, but I'm just saying as, a, as the trial judge entering this ruling, um, finding specific general jurors, or sorry, entering this ruling today, finding specific personal jurisdiction over my client, I just wanted you to incorporate into the, the order, uh, whether it in orally, I understand because we're doing this through Zoom, um, you know, that the appellate division may grant, and, and, and you know, it's their discretion, leave for interlocutory appeal in the interest of justice because of the, you know, substantial question on the differences of the legal issues that we discussed quite at length today. So, you know, I don't think it's necessary for me to do that, Council. I think you can. Um, uh, we've been on the record maybe an hour. Um, I think that basically the facts, um, the facts really aren't in dispute. Um, and that's why I. You know, I, I think it's the application of the law to the facts that could be in dispute. However, I don't think it's necessary for me to say that the appellate division should take it up. It's up to them. They have, um, they may see it more clearly than I see it, um, having done more of these than I have, but um, um I'm not going to add that to the order. You can certainly, um, I would not be shocked, counsel, if you take it up and no offense taken from that because um, it, um, there are factors in this that could educate us. So, um, but I don't know. Sometimes they don't see things as important as we see it. Understood. And um, I can't, um, I can't say that um, so I'm, I'm going to decline that additional part of your, um, at, at that request, counsel. Understood, Your Honor. Fair enough. I appreciate it. Thank you. Okay. All right. So I'll sign an order regarding that, but we have some discovery issues um, that we need to get resolved. Have they resolved themselves, counsel? Uh, between Hi, Honor, me and Judge Mobile Wash, I believe we have, Your Honor, Mr. McHale. If I may, uh, yeah, David McHale on behalf of Judge Mobile Wash. Uh, I want to thank uh, Mr. Devine's office for taking, uh, operating under duress and getting me um, pretty much, the, I think, the entire record. And I, I've received a certification from his office that I've now received the entire record from the related personal injury case. Um, so I will be withdrawing the motion to dismiss against agility with one caveat that uh, the actual written responses to my notice to produce of uh, November 22nd, 2019 are still outstanding. I'm going to withdraw the motion, but uh, without prejudice as to that particular piece of the discovery. Um, I don't expect it to be a problem. We've discussed a 30-day window for them to get me those written responses to the notice to produce. Uh, I just preserve the right to uh, refile the motion as to that particular piece of discovery in 30 days should I not, you know, get that. Okay. Now, is that your only, there was another motion. motion there is a to second compel. motion. 
That's correct, Your Honor. Uh, as against the plaintiff republic, um, right. uh, at this at this point, I have not received any responses from Republic Services, so uh, that motion can go forward today. All right, well, Your Honor, this is this is Christopher Morrill for Republic Services. We did provide the answers to supplemental interrogatories yesterday afternoon, later in the afternoon to all parties. So uh, that's not correct. We actually did provide them, albeit late, uh, but under the circumstances, my office was struggling to get all the exhibits together uh, to provide them with the discovery, but it has actually been provided. I know Mr. Yeager at least said he was having trouble getting all portions of it from my office. Um, and we, I indicated that I would have my secretary attempt to resend it because it was voluminous in nature and she had to break it up into various parts. I don't know if Mr. McHale did not get that, but I do know that it was sent out yesterday afternoon. Okay, well, what, how should we handle it? Do you want to reschedule the motion against the plaintiff for, um, for one cycle or two cycles to see if you get the information? That's fine, Your Honor. And one cycle, if you don't mind, uh, just because I am trying to get a handle on all of this so I can make some determinations about moving forward with any additional depositions. Well, as to what your, as to your motion, we'll just, once, uh, the one is to agility is withdrawn without prejudice and the one as to Republic will reschedule for, um, do you want one or two cycles, Council? Uh, I prefer one, but if we are operating under the level of duress uh, uh, that we are, I, I have no problem with two if that's what Council for Republic wants. Okay. Um, what? Two would probably make more sense. I, did everybody, just for the other parties that are on the line, did you get my discovery yeah. responses yesterday afternoon? Uh, yes, Agility received them at 9.02 p.m. last night. <laughs> caught in, but Chris, uh, they, Chris, they were caught in my spam, and because they were so large, uh, they actually came in, I think, three or four emails from Nicolina Brown. That's my assistant. That's correct. So you would look for Mr. McHale, an email from Nicolina Brown. And I'm still having... I'm looking right now. I do see that. I did, in fact, get three emails that are about content to them that I may have to come back to you to figure out how to open. Okay. Yeah, my... Okay. Well, we'll put that off for two cycles and uh, the motion can be withdrawn if you've resolved it. Okay. Absolutely. Thank you. Your All right, Council. How's everybody doing? Okay. Under all these circumstances. As good as could be expected, Your Honor. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, Josh, how are things out in Chicago? I actually live in Camden County, New Jersey. It's actually, you know, we're, we're doing okay out here uh, for the most part. It's more North Jersey, I think, that's really been really whacked hard, uh, you know, but uh, I just know that Boston, Chicago are also having some difficulty. How are you guys doing? It's incredibly scary. Uh, there's almost nobody in the downtown area at all. And uh, it's been that way for a couple of weeks now. Um, and hopefully, all I can say is hopefully this thing resolves sooner rather than later. But I don't think any of us know exactly what's going to happen. So for now, everybody is safe. And that's the most important thing. And so we'll all just continue to keep our fingers crossed, I think. Yeah. What I find really interesting is different states treat law firms as essential businesses or non-essential businesses. And uh, we want to put all of our offices, but I'm in, I'm in Boston, I'm in New York, I'm in Newark, Cherry Hill, Philadelphia, uh, and in Delaware. And Delaware is the only one Delaware that is, the only one that is a, an essential business. So we closed it, notwithstanding that, but I found it interesting that Delaware would actually not mandate closures of law offices. Well, good luck to all of you and stay healthy. Um, and, um, and, um, We'll be hearing from we'll you. We'll be hearing from you. Okay. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you, Thanks. Thank you, Your Honor. Thanks. Thank you, Your Honor. Yep. Bye-bye. Yep. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.
Thank okay. you, Your Honor. Yeah, thank thank you, you, Your Honor. Thanks. Thank you, Your Honor. Yep. Bye-bye. Yep. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.